that's 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 quite a, an act to follow there. Um, I'm um, I'm Peg Laird, uh, chair of the board of trustees of the Delaware Historical Society, and I want to thank you all for being here uh, this evening to celebrate Garrett and Tatiana Copeland as this year's history makers. Um, we have several special guests who I want to especially thank for uh, for uh, being here this evening. Uh, past governor, uh, the Honorable Jack Markell. Our current governor, the Honorable John Carney. Uh, the mayor of Wilmington, uh, the Honorable Michael Przicki. And uh, the president of the Wilmington City Council, the Honorable Hanifa Shabazz. Thank you all so much for, for coming. <laughs> So, um, as, as many of you might know, um, I'm kind of a, a language and etymology geek, um, and uh, from my um, sort of square perspective, there's no better word to describe uh, Garrett and Tatiana Copeland uh, than philanthropists. So, you probably know that philanthropy means uh, a love of one's fellow man, but the Greek behind it actually is a little bit more nuanced. So philanthropy um, actually signifies not only a love, but an affection for, a cherishing of, and a, a, a kindliness towards humankind. And I'm, I'm uh, taking the expansive view of uh, anthropos there. This, to me, describes uh, Garrett and Tatiana to a T on so many levels. It actually starts kind of small, and you've just heard, uh, you've heard the Copelands described as a team several times in, in our, our video. And anyone seeing the picture of the two of them together can recognize that that team is built on a deep love of one another, but also on their mutual affection for and respect of each other. In essence, they are a team that's founded on philanthropy in its truest sense. It's really lovely. And this philanthropy spills over to their family and to their friends and to the numerous organizations that they've supported. The leaders of several of these organizations have um, described how the Copeland support has impacted their mission. Uh, but the amazing thing is, is that when I looked at the list, Philanthropy, that is, affection and care for humankind, is central to the mission of almost, uh, actually, of every organization that's represented here tonight. These are organizations that bring joy to people through the beauty of nature and horticulture. These are organizations that foster and promote the arts, which is one of the defining achievements uh, that make us human. These are organizations that support women and encourage girls to become leaders of the future. Organizations that preserve and share the history of our state and of the nation. There's a school whose motto is all things in love and a university that develops knowledge and fosters the free exchange of ideas. There are organizations that recognize individual achievements, that bring holiday cheer to soldiers and that bring a furry friend to anybody who needs one. These are organizations that help people live independent lives and to share one more birthday or anniversary with a loved one. So what we have here is really an echo chamber. Uh, the love and care and affection of one couple for each other is magnified outwards through space and time and through people and is echoing here around all of us. It's pretty extraordinary. But this is a moment where we can take that echo and we can reflect it back to them. It's time for us to be the philanthropists for Garrett and Tatiana, for us to show our care and affection and thanks and our congratulations. So I'd like you all, those of you who still have some wine and those of you who don't, to join me in a toast to Garrett and Tatiana Copeland. Cheers. So, so I would actually like um, to invite 
Mr. and Mrs. Copeland to join me on the stage, if you don't mind. She's a cousin. <laughs> Um, now, now this is the point in the program where, where I am, I am, I am, uh, it, where it says I'm supposed to uh, give them uh, the award. However, we happen to have uh, the actual author of the proclamation here this evening, and he outranks me. So, may I invite Governor Carney to join me on the stage, please? <laughs> My note said that Peg was going to read this proclamation as well. <laughs> I looked over to Governor Markell and Carl and I said, Governor, why don't you come up here and help me present this award? He said, no, I'm done with this. <laughs> I, I don't know whether you noticed, but he's the only guy in here without a tie on. And I don't think he's, I don't think he's uh, worn a tie since January of 2017. <laughs> it's great to know that there's a life after this, this job. I get a lot of invitations uh, sent to my home, which by the way is not a good idea for those of you who want me to attend your event. And I don't look at them as closely as, as I should, but I do look at the invitation that I get for this event each year. And when I saw that uh, the Historical Society was honoring these, this couple, these extraordinary Delawareans, I said to my scheduling secretary, I have got to be there. And notwithstanding the fact that this is a Tuesday, which means the legislature in, uh, is in session, I hightailed it out of Dover pretty quickly, Governor Markell, to get up, get up here to really say thanks. We cannot say thanks enough for the tremendous mark on our community that these two individuals have made. And it's just all across this city, uh, across our county and state. It's here in this building. They were instrumental in bringing this building back to life. They've been instrumental in so many of the cultural and arts of, of, of facilities uh, up and down Market Street and all the various organizations that were so re reflected, uh, well reflected on the, uh, on the video. And as governor, you need partners like this to do good things. I, I'm not sure really I'm a partner though. When Tatiana summons, I go. <laughs> And when Tatiana asks for something, I try to respond. Uh, but they're really delightful to work with, and they've just made an incredible uh, difference here in our community. And I'd like to read this tribute to them. Be it hereby known to all that John Carney, Governor of the State of Delaware, and Bethany Hall, along Lieutenant Governor, are so proud to recognize Garrett and Tatiana Copeland. Governor Carney, Lieutenant Governor Hall Long take great pleasure in recognizing Garrett and Tatiana as the recipients of the Delaware Historical Society's 12th Delaware History Makers Award. We applaud Garrett and Tatiana for their long-standing commitment and unmatched, unmatched generosity in supporting numerous nonprofit organizations in Delaware and the surrounding region. For nearly four decades, the Copelands have made transformational contributions that have had wide-ranging impacts on our state. The Copeland's vision and commitment to animal welfare, art, education, healthcare, history, music, and the environment are exemplified by their loyal support of a wide variety of organizations. We join the whole community here tonight in commending, commending Garrett and Tatiana Copeland for their dedication and their leadership qualities that empower others in our state, presented on this seventh day of May 2019 by order of the governor. <laughs> and just to follow on Governor Carney's remarks, I want to present to Garrett the uh, History Makers Award, the Crystal Award to Tatiana and Garrett Copeland.
And, 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 if, and if that weren't enough, woo, woo, woo. Wow, it's heavy. <laughs> uh, I, I have the pleasure of, um, of presenting a, a replica or a, a print of um, a family German Shepherd that I believe looks a lot like one of your favorite pets from the uh, Irene DuPont collection of the Delaware Historical Society. So. <laughs> I just want to add that the love of Garrett's life, true love, is not me. It was his German shepherd. Black German shepherd called Gertrude. That's all I'm going to say. Wow. I am honored. And yes, I'm humbled. This is so great a thing. And it reminds me, when I've heard of all these wonderful things we've done, many years ago, they used to make westerns. And you had the good guys and you had the bad guys. And you could tell the difference because the good guys wore the white hats and the bad guys wore the black hats. It was very simple. And there was a great actor there by the name of Alan Ladd. But Alan Ladd's problem was he was very short. So whenever the women came along, they either had to put Alan Ladd up on a box or they had to dig a trench for the woman to come up to her so she'd be the same height. And it was one of the great westerns in the final scene, the village, the town is half in flames. There are dead men hanging off of roofs, there are dead men hanging over the hitching rails, there are dead men in the watering troughs. And the leading lady rushes up and says, oh, oh, you've saved our town, you've saved our way of life, how do we ever thank you? And Alan Ladd looks down, and there's a metal muffin, and he kicks it with a boot, and he says, "All oh, shucks, ma'am, it twarn't nothing." <laughs> and yeah, it twarn't nothing. But there were some ruling factors in my life that I grew up with. One is our my grandfather who lived in Connecticut, who said, "With privilege comes responsibility." How true! How true! And yes, we certainly grew up with a lot of privilege. So therefore, the responsibility was made very clear and very evident at a young age. And my father and I were talking one night, and he looked at me and he said, Garrett, he said, try to make this world a little better place than when you came in. <clears throat> and that was it. And then another one which always sat in my mind, which I was 12 or 13 and went out to Longwood Gardens one weekend with my parents and we met with Uncle Pierre and he had one of the gardeners and we were going around and after a while, you know, a 12 or 13 year old kid gets a little bit bored and there was a limb of a tree lying on the ground and I said, oh, I'll pick this up and I'll ask Uncle Pierre where he'd like me to put it. Well, as I picked it up, I turned and I don't know who it was, but I hit somebody with the limb of a tree. And my mother, of course, went slightly ballistic. And I remember Uncle Pierre turning around and saying, Pamela, I will handle this. And he turned to me and I said, oh my God, I'm never going to see another birthday. I'm never going to see another Christmas. I'm, I'm toast. I'm going. I'm finished. And he looked at me and he said, Garrett, remember, a stick has two ends. You know, you think about it, every piece of paper has two sides. Even a sphere has two sides. And I think those three things have been a leading fact in my life of why I did the things in philanthropy that I have done. And early in my life, my mother was probably one of the early environmentalists in this country. And she would take me out at Mount Cuba and we'd go through the woods and the fields and she'd say, stop. What do you see? What do you hear? What do you smell? And I guess that really opened my mind to the environment and how important it was. And so I got involved, very simply, very. Then in 1973, Frolic Weymouth called me up and said, cuz, come work for me out at the Brandywine. I want you to run the Environmental Management Center. What did I know about the environment? Well, I learned very quickly. And over the years, the Environmental Management Center, through great works and lots of toil by a lot of people, there are now approximately 60,000 acres along the Brandywine which are protected in perpetuity. And this is a major and I'm proud of that number. 
and I was on the Longwood Foundation Board, and you know, the meetings would come along, and he would come, they asked from Frolic Weymouth, and the other cousins on the board say, here we go again. And I would simply look at him and say, well, what color would you like your water tomorrow? Good point. And it was done. So that was really very, very simple things to do. But it's how I got involved in the environment and the DNS and, and Delaware Wildlands and, and the Audubon Society and the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, all of them, because I feel strongly that we have to have open space, we have to keep the environment, or we are going to disappear. It's quite simple. <laughs> and it was kind of one of the other crazy things, too, in my life that that led me to Planned Parenthood. Uh, my father was very instrumental in Planned Parenthood, um, and he was very big in international Planned Parenthood. And I said, why international? And he looked at me with this twinkle in his eye, and he said, that's the easy one. And I said, what do you mean? That an acre of land supports X people. When you have X plus one, you've got problems. The problem is how do you get rid of the one? And that got me into the Delaware League of Planned Parenthood in Wilmington, which I started at the bottom and ended up being the chairman. But we've grown and we have helped so many people. We are the largest cancer screening facility in the state of Delaware for men and women. And this is something which has been a big player in my life, is helping these young people of all colors, all creeds, all, all finances to help themselves either to have a child or not to have a child. So these are the things that kind of helping mankind, helping mankind improve itself. And so from there, about 14 years ago, I took a journey down to the Christiana Hospital. And I had six-way heart bypass. And it was done by a young doctor who had just come here from the Cleveland Clinic, who was sitting in the third row, who saved my life. And it was quite simple. So when they came and made the ask to my darling wife, Tanya, and she said, we'll think about it. And I said, no, we'll do it. And she looked at me and I said, this was a simple ask. I said, when somebody saves your life, you save other people's lives. I mean, it didn't take, you know, didn't take any brain surgery to figure that one out. And so that's how, through that and all what you saw in there and the additional work we've done with, with the hospital, it's, it's, um, it's where you feel I've helped somebody. And for many years after the machine came in, total strangers would walk up to us when they found out I was Richard Copeland. They'd say, you saved my life, my husband's life, my wife's life, my best friend's life. And when you hear that, it really, you really say, damn it, I've done something good. And that's all what I've been trying to do along this thing. And one of the other ones we've gotten very involved in, and it means a great deal to Tanya and me, and that is stockings for soldiers. And this was started by a single lady here in Wilmington, and she started getting people to donate time and material to send Christmas stockings to our military people, male and female, throughout the world. And they are doing 10,000 stockings a year. And they have a lot of good things and one of the interesting things and so we found out what you put in these stockings. And they put in candy, chewing gum, a deck of cards, a paperback book, and the two most important things, a toothbrush and a tooth, tube of toothpaste and a pair of clean socks. And when you're in those places, and someone here I know have been there, boy, a pair of clean socks was so fabulous. And it's, it's these little things that you, you sit back and when I saw what we've done and, you know, all shucks, ma'am, it tore nothing. And yet, I think I have supported my grandfather and my father and my mother in trying to make the world a little better place and trying to keep humanity going and improving and living longer. And the art museum, yes, I come from the uh, Blue Hen State. I'm a chicken. It was founded by my grandmother Copeland, who we never knew. She died when uh, our father was a sophomore junior at Harvard University. And when she died in the Wilmington newspaper, it was written in her obituary, 
that shops closed in her honor. So she must have been a hell of a woman. And she had an interesting hobby. She did wood carving, not of objects, but of stairs, bookshelves, door jams, I mean, <laughs> this sort of thing. So she must have been an incredible woman. And she started the Delaware Art Museum with some other people when Howard Pyle died, leaving Mrs. Pyle with a raft of kids and absolutely no means of support. And my father then ran the art museum. And so when the call came to take over the helm of the Delaware Art Museum, I wasn't going to say no, because I know perfectly well my grandmother and my parents have the great capability of sending a thunderbolt down and saying, you're going to do it. So I didn't want that to happen, so I, I joined up to it. So that's how I'm there, and somehow I've been kind of appointed uh, chairman for life. Um, and I hope to live for a long time so I can keep harassing them. It's great fun. Because I can't get thrown off the board. I mean, when you're the chairman of the board, they can't throw you out. So that's where we've kind of made, made the whole plan. And, and I don't resent you know, any bit of it. The Historical Society, yes, there's the Copeland Room. There's a plaque up there, and there are two names on it, Mr. and Mrs. Charles Copeland and Mr. and Mrs. Lamont Pont Copeland. And so I'm glad to be involved with this institution by direction or indirection. So I thank you all for the honor, and I appreciate it. And as I said, I am truly humbled. And now you're going to get the best part of the show. You get my wife <laughs> of 40 years. <laughs> Don't worry, it's short. When I was sitting there listening to the Copeland Quartet, I was thinking about just being here. A week ago, I was at the Queen Theater, and the Jefferson Awards were here. Sam Beard started that with Jacqueline Kennedy. It's this extraordinary organization that does a lot with volunteerism, particularly at the student level, children level. And after that um, was over, Governor Cooney was there to give some of the awards, but we hugged and kissed, and he said to me, you know the Queen Theater? I, mean, I suppose he hasn't seen me here before. And I go, yes, of course I know the Queen Theater, Governor. I said, do you know where you are? He goes, the Queen Theater. I said, no, more specifically, do you know where you are? And he goes, yes, the Queen Theater. What else is there? I said, you're in the Copeland room. <laughs> and he laughed, and I guess, you do know it. So I'm sitting in the Copeland room, listening to the Copeland Quartet. And it is a little bit surreal. I can tell you it feels very strange and very wonderful. Where does this start, this philanthropy, I suppose I could say? So many, many years ago, the Kelmer Nicole was in the planning stages. Let us visualize this. A ship that was built in the 1600s, and you're trying to make a replica in it in Wilmington, Delaware. Why? It, it didn't get an enormous amount of support back then because nobody visualized what it would become. So they came to my husband to ask for his help, and he kindly said, no way. <laughs> so uh, for some reason, somebody had the great idea to ask me. So I have a very complicated background. Russian parents, born in Germany, lived in Denmark, moved to Argentina where I grew up, and then we came to the States on a Scandinavian ship. You see where this is going. So at age 18, I celebrated my birthday on a Scandinavian ship. I'm surrounded by tall, gorgeous Norwegians. Um, and when we landed in New Orleans, I had my first date. Now, before you put it all together, yes, I was 18. Yes, I was brought up in South America. No, you did not date. Uh, I had my first date and my first kiss with a tall, gorgeous Norwegian. 
So I have some very special memories connected with a Scandinavian ship. So did that help me say yes? Yes, it was very much in the back of my mind. Let's make this happen. Um, one of my jobs was to become the godmother of the ship. And today, I have a fabulous chiropractor. He's here tonight, Art Travis, who's married to the wonderful Judy, who has done the soldiers, stockings for soldiers. So Art tells me this morning, he was putting me together so I could come and stand here. And he said, it's going to rain tonight. And I go, no. So Godmother had, did you see the weather outside? It's gorgeous. I take full responsibility. <laughs> I came to the U.S. as an immigrant. It's a word that is very much in the news today. And this country gave me every opportunity to do something very special. I don't believe there is another country in the world who would have given a foreigner and a woman the opportunities I had in the United States. They are truly remarkable. So speaking as an immigrant, I also have to share something that probably very few people know. I have also been an illegal immigrant with my parents as a child. And we survived only based on the kindness of strangers. We managed to have food and clothing because of that. So I've been an illegal alien and an immigrant. I don't think when you look at me here that you necessarily think of those words. But having been that, I know how important it is to rely on others to help you when you cannot help yourself. And that probably is at the very core of my philosophy, to try to do something better, if I can possibly do that. And I am so blessed to have found a partner who feels the same way about this. I have had this incredible chance given me to help organizations and to make them survive well. I've already mentioned the Calmar Nickel. Um, as an aside, when it was launched, uh, it was to be baptized with a magnum of the shame. I was very pleased about that because I helped organize that. So here I am, godmother of the ship, big sponsor of the ship. The damn wine is mine. I'm ready to launch and put, you know, the, whatever it is, you, you, you christen the ship. And I'm told, no, it's not your job. It's the governor's wife's job. <laughs> and so, <clears throat> She's not here, so I can mention it. It was Governor Carper at the time, and Mrs. Carper christened the ship with my bottle of Magnum Luchin, <laughs> and it seemed to have survived very well. Dogs. The dogs are a very important part of our life, and I had a wonderful dog called Reggie, and Reggie went to my office every day of his 14 years. So when he died, we created a Reggie Fund with Dollar Humane and Brandywine SPCA. And its particular function is to, keep, uh, to help people who do not have the funds to completely pay for whatever surgery or care those pets need. And Reggie's fund steps forward and helps them. <laughs> now it also applies to cats by the way. I'm not sure <laughs> what Reggie would think of that. I have a hope that up there in heaven he has a good heart and says, okay, do it with cats as well. The heart center, my husband mentioned it. Dr. Bambury is sitting here in the audience. He saved my husband, my husband's life. Uh, Dr. Nevin from Christiana Care, I do have one thing I have noticed about doctors. The price of their toys is very high. However, 
when it came to do this uh, incredible um, gizmo <laughs> that they had to put in there that does wonderful things for your heart and can save lives. What else could we say but yes, breast cancer. That struck me too. And I am very happy that I was able to donate two special machines that help women with less pain, less effort to identify something. It is... Um, I found out this week that somebody who's very, very close to my heart and is here tonight had to go and use the services and told me yesterday that I had saved her life. That's good to know. Art, music, museums, these are things that cannot be touched by war or human intolerance to people who look different from you. It seems to exist in its own wonderful, beautiful world. And if I can do something to make art and theater and music come to life, uh, I love it. Some of you may know that I come from a very musical background. My mother's uncle was Sergei Rachmaninov. So I grew up always, always hearing about his music. Uh, Delaware Symphony, I like Russian music above all else, hint. But um, I was named after his daughter Tatiana. So I'm a black sheep in the family. I don't play any instrument and I don't read music. It's a disaster. I just hope that Uncle Sergei will forgive me that I wear the hat of helping and sponsoring the musicians who can do all of that, and that's a big help too. Um, I know Brendan Cook is in the audience, uh, Opera Delaware, and forgive me for what I'm about to say. My husband has a thing about opera. It's not good, by the way. So he has. We have a point system. He has certain demerits that are cleared up by the points that are given to a certain opera when he gets to attend it. So he gets two burning points if it's an opera by Aid, like Gardy. It's probably 10 points if it's an opera by Wagner. And God forbid if it's Strauss, as in Richard Strauss, it's 15 points. We've never gotten to that part because he's never <laughs> gone to a, a, anything by Red Shaws. But I am going to make sure that he sees one of your productions with no burning bones. And to conclude, I don't know how much I believe in coincidences, but my life has been ruled by it quite a bit. In today's paper, the news drawn today, uh, I love crossword puzzles, I love Sudokus, I love all of that. So the answer to the crossword puzzle today, to the word puzzle, is a sentence that was mentioned by Ralph Waldo Emerson. And I'm reading it in today's paper. To know even one life has breathed easier because you have lived that is to have succeeded. I love the thought. I pass it on to all of you. It's a fabulous thought. Thank you.